It was Sunday, May 11th, 1969. A 1.5 kilogram briquette of scrap plutonium had spontaneously ignited and burned without detection in a plutonium foundry glove box line, building 776. As the plutonium burned, it heated storage racks made of Benelux and plexiglass. After reaching the ignition point, the fire spread throughout the storage rack. Heavy smoke moved through the ventilation system and clogged the filters in the first plenum. On the first floor, the intense heat burned away several gloves, allowing room air to enter the burning interior of the glove box. The fire spread and engulfed additional shielding. Because of improperly designed detection systems, there was a considerable delay before the fire department received an alarm. Realizing the severity of the fire, the fire department decided to use water to extinguish the flames. Almost five hours after it began, the fire was out. Even though Building 776 sustained extensive damage, no serious injuries resulted. However, many questions remained unanswered. Why did the fire start? Why did it remain undetected for so long? How effective were the plenums and ventilation systems? Were the alarm systems adequate? The 1969 fire was the focus of numerous studies, investigations, and subsequent reports. Since that time, improvements in fire prevention and protection have totaled more than $115 million. And the reason for all the studies is plutonium. But what is plutonium? It is a radioactive pyrophoric material that burns with practically no flame. As it converts to an oxide, it takes on a red glow, much like a charcoal briquette. However, at high temperatures, it could ignite other combustible materials. For this reason, Rocky Flats follows a strict set of procedures that considerably lessens the possibility of plutonium fires. We have guidelines for the storage of plutonium. First, workers store all plutonium materials in appropriate sized metal containers. Unlike the storage in 1969, all containers must have tight-fitting lids. Had this been the case in 1969, the plutonium fire might not have ignited. Secondly, we store containers of plutonium which could potentially ignite in a different manner. We place them on metal racks with contact heat detectors. Since combustibles caused the fire to spread throughout the glove box line in 1969, we've made major changes to deal with this problem. With the exception of rubber gloves, we have removed almost all combustible materials, including Benelux and plexiglass shielding. Any Benelux shielding which remains has been covered with a fire retardant paint, stainless steel protective covers, or reflective shields. To eliminate the need for external shielding, we have redesigned all new glove boxes. They contain water-filled double walls. Combustible loading for new buildings average less than half a pound per square foot. That's four and a half pounds under low fire loading used by other industrial facilities. As a further deterrent to combustion, we have nitrogen inerted the glove box atmosphere. This three to five percent oxygen atmosphere reduces the possibility of plutonium or any other combustible material from igniting. Today's plenums are the result of extensive testing and the HEPA, or High Efficiency Particulate Air Filters, have a number of improvements. HEPA filters can perform continuously at 300 degrees for two hours without any loss of integrity. To control the incoming air temperature, we have installed water spray heads and mesh filters upstream of the HEPA filters. 
These sprays continuously cool incoming air to a maximum of 300 degrees. Manually operated spray heads also protect the face of the first stage filters. During the 1969 fire, temperatures in the main plenum never reached the 250 degrees necessary to trip the heat detection system. This has changed. Today, heat detectors in the incoming air ducts automatically actuate the spray systems at lesser temperatures. Baffles at the inlet ducts control and distribute the air to the cooling chamber. This improves the water spray cooling efficiency. Ventilation flow is another area of change. Each glove box has a supply and exhaust. This restricts any fire to that particular box. Roll-up fire doors cut off uninterrupted ventilation flow and prevent fires from spreading. Due to criticality concerns, water sprinklers did not exist on the first floor of Building 776 at the time of the fire. Had sprinklers been in place, the fire department could have controlled the fire before it reached the free burn phase. Since that time, we have installed a wet pipe sprinkler protection system. This system has 100% coverage throughout all production buildings. And we've made further changes. We've bolstered the water tank supply. We now have two 2500 GPM fire pumps which provide additional water supplies. Each of the pumps takes suction from a million gallon water supply. In the event of failures or when water pressure drops below 65 pounds, the electric pump automatically starts. If water pressure drops below 50 PSI, the diesel pump kicks in. To further ensure proper water supply, we extended the under and above ground water distribution system in several locations. This loop grid makes water available from more than one direction. Another improvement is the installation of criticality drains in glove boxes. To control fire water in most operating areas, doorways are now equipped with retention dams. Alarms constitute another area of improvement. We continually upgrade the system to provide faster and more reliable detection. We have installed a new computerized alarm system. A central dispatch center in plant protection receives all plant fire alarms. In addition, fire alarms are received at the fire department communication center. Remember that the type of detection devices used in the glove boxes at the time of the fire considerably delayed the alarms. To correct this problem, we modified the glove box overheat detection systems. Plutonium storage racks now have small contact type detectors. These detectors monitor each can for possible overheat conditions. They activate at 140 degrees. Each glove box contains at least one heat probe which monitors the ambient air temperature. They activate at 190 degrees. They are also sensitive to rapidly rising temperature conditions and provide redundant monitoring capabilities. One final area of improvement concerns firewalls and doors. They provide containment and reduce contamination spread. Firewalls have a minimum fire resistance rating of two hours. All openings in these walls have the equivalent protection. Fire rated doors on all stairways and floor penetrations maintain vertical separation. To ensure the improvements are adequate, a number of fire reviews have been conducted. In 1969, the Department of Energy hired independent agencies to conduct fire protection surveys at Rocky Flats. They performed these surveys in the fall of 1969 and the early part of 1970. The report contained 105 recommendations for improvements. After conducting a second survey in 1974 and 75, 
the report stated, most of the recommendations outlined in the first report have been accomplished, resulting in a well-protected plant having good loss prevention programs. To date, all 105 recommendations are complete. A fire design review report on the Rocky Flats plant issued by Terra Corporation analyzed fire prevention and protection features. The report summary states, the plant has developed an extensive fire safety program to minimize fire potential. Particularly for fires which might result in a substantial release of radioactive material to the environment. The review also reports favorably on many of the improvements covered in this program. The Rocky Flats Fire Department administers and oversees the fire protection program. The department maintains sufficient personnel to staff four divisions. A minimum of six firefighters and two officers work each of three shifts. These shifts provide 24-hour, seven-day-a-week coverage. Each person works 56 hours a week. All personnel are cross-trained within the fire department. Additional specialized training averages more than 100 hours a year. All suppression and prevention personnel hold state firefighter certificates. Six fire prevention specialists are involved specifically in prevention work and maintain 40-hour work weeks. The fire department also furnishes emergency medical service to all plant employees. Each uniform firefighter must also be a certified EMT. In addition to these duties, personnel also train plant employees. They provide two hours of training to 120 employees each month. These employees make up building emergency support teams, known as BEST members. In the event of an emergency, these members support the fire department at their respective buildings. The Rocky Flats Fire Department has one of the most complete and comprehensive prevention programs. The network utilizes fire protection engineers, fire safety specialists, and fire prevention specialists. Fire protection engineers are responsible for the review and approval of all construction and modifications to existing facilities. They ensure compliance with sound fire protection principles. The improved risk or highly protected risk concept is a basis for all work. Fire protection engineers work closely with the fire prevention group on various operational projects. To comply with DOE standards, they conduct annual or semi-annual surveys of all buildings. They also evaluate changes to determine fire loss potentials. A minimum of two fire safety inspections are made each day. Each inspector looks for general housekeeping violations, hazardous materials handling and storage, blocked exits, and NFPA or DOE code violations. If a violation occurs, the inspector writes a report and sends it to the building superintendent. It states what action must be taken to bring the building up to code. The Fire Prevention Bureau then conducts a follow-up inspection of the area to assure correction of the violation. Once a month, fire safety specialists conduct a system operation test on all plant fire detection and alarm systems. Through this program, we detect and correct problems before they occur. All fire safety inspections occur on a rotation schedule. This assures the inspection of each manufacturing and chemical processing building every two weeks. At least once a month, support buildings also receive an inspection. Fire inspectors supervise the distribution of welding permits. To obtain a permit, all combustibles in the immediate area must be removed or reduced to a minimum. The proper extinguisher must be on the welding cart. 
and the operation cannot promote an uncontrolled fire condition. When entry into a manhole is necessary, worker safety always takes priority. Before work can begin, the vessel or pit must be checked for oxygen content and combustible vapor limits. The inspector also recommends safety precautions and equipment necessary to perform the job safely. The scope of the Fire Prevention Bureau goes far beyond that of a typical bureau. Scheduling, compliance inspections, and in-depth inspection surveys are routine activities. In addition to normal duties, the Bureau places and services more than 3,500 fire extinguishers. In the event of a small fire in any occupied building, Employees know that an extinguisher is no farther away than 75 feet. They also know the extinguisher will work. Once each year, prevention personnel test numerous detection devices, such as smoke detectors, heat detectors, glove box overheat detectors, and storage tray detection devices. This assignment is a major time-consuming responsibility, but it assures the proper function of each alarm point. In addition, these inspectors perform acceptance tests on all fire protection systems at the time of installation. As you can see, we've made great improvements at our plant. Everything we learn from the 69 fire will help prevent another one from occurring. And we'll continue to strive for improvement in every facet of our operations.